Let's take. Hello, everyone. My name is Elizabeth, the education coordinator for Marlene's Market and Deli. This afternoon's guest that we have with us is Gavin T. Meyer, Garden Hotline Educator. And we are so grateful to have this partnership with Garden Hotline. And uh, thank you so much, Gavin, for being here. Yeah, of course. So you have a really wonderful topic that you're going to be sharing with us this afternoon, your garden, uh, your vegetable garden as a backyard habitat. Yeah, um, I'll give a quick introduction about myself. Uh, my name is Gavin. Um, I work for the Garden Hotline, so I have a background in environmental studies. I have a master's degree in environmental studies, and I'm particularly excited about teaching this um, workshop just because I feel like it's in my wheelhouse as far as integrating I don't know, um, nature with just gardening. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna share my screen. Let's see if this works. Give me just one sec. All right, can everybody see this? Looks great. Cool. So I'm gonna start off by doing just a, I guess a, a thought exercise before I before we uh, dive into this. But um, I have a question that I wanna ask everybody who's here and there's not necessarily a right answer to it. Um, take a moment to think about your garden space. If you don't have a garden, think about a green space outside that you're particularly fond of. What role do living things play in this space? So think about that for just a moment. Okay, cool. Um, keep that in your mind and then we'll ask a follow-up question after the presentation is done. So. Starting off, just to provide a little context or framing, um, this is just a, a simple definition of what habitat is. So the natural home or environment of an animal, plant, or other organism, a particular type of environment regarded as a home for organisms. So organisms, if we broke that down, it could be, you know, on a, a large level, it could be a raccoon, I guess it could be a human. And then even on a, a cellular level, it could be um, a simple celled organism like bacteria or something like that. Um, a couple of pictures here just to get started for, you know, thinking about how organisms interact with our garden habitat is to the left, you have a picture of a lady beetle or a ladybug. Um, and then to the right, you have a picture of an orb weaver spider. It is particularly a European cross spider. Um, so you'll notice these uh, show up usually around the fall. It's something that I look forward particularly. Um, does anybody have any guesses as to what these two bugs have in common? Can everybody still hear me just to make sure? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, do they eat um, uh, pests? Yes, good answer. Um, so both of these animals are considered, or both of these insects, one of them is an arachnid, are considered beneficial bugs. So uh, ladybugs eat aphids and other sap sucking insects. And then so European cross spiders, um, I think although we have a you know a pretty dominant fear of spiders in our society play an important role in the garden and that they're going to help um, capture you know flying insects uh, and they, they play a pivotal role in just the the ecosystem yeah so um this is going to provide a little bit of i guess groundwork as far as what we're going to cover in the workshop so understanding your garden as habitats, um, we wanna think about scale 
So different garden beds and small areas in the garden can be a habitat of their own. There's a picture of a leaf. Um, I think it looks like it's a collard green perhaps, but um, definitely open to interpretation. When I think about this in relationship to scale, I think, oh, like what small, you know, creepy crawlers are living under that giant leaf. Um, the second topic that we're going to cover is soil life. So what goes on beneath the surface of the garden soil is more important than what you are viewing above. This was kind of my, um, I guess, a big revelation to me when I started at the garden hotline is um, despite my experience gardening, I guess I never really thought of soil health as um, probably the most important element of um, just either urban farming or growing edible food or even, you know, growing ornamental plants for your landscape is soil is really going to be the canvas um, for every, you know, great thing that you're going to grow. So at the Garden Hotline, it's really important for us to teach people about soil health um, as kind of just the, the basis for everything else taking place. Um, a third thing that we're going to cover is just this concept of um, non-natives. Um, if anybody's familiar, non-natives are kind of, it's an interesting concept, but basically what we mean um, are plants, um, could be animals that didn't originate in the ecosystem in this part of the Americas where we live. So. Um, it could be somewhere else. It could be Europe, uh, parts of Asia, um, yeah, anywhere. Um, and just to be clear, this doesn't necessarily mean that these are uh, bad plants, um, like say noxious weeds, for example. I think in the picture, it looks like there is red chard. I'm not sure where that um, originated from, but that's what that's demonstrating. Okay, so scale. Um, if you look, there is a picture of a sidewalk to the left. Looks like there's a green space. I see a school bus in the background and I see an apartment complex. And then to the right, it looks like there's garden beds. And then if you look really close, there is a squirrel and then I think a pile of snow. So I'm guessing that this is in winter time. So, the fact that it is in winter time and the fact that it's an urban space, the fact that there's a squirrel, the fact that there's lawn and trees on one side of the sidewalk and there are garden beds on the other side of the sidewalk tells us a lot about um, just the growing conditions and it leads us to competition for space between the garden and lawn. So. When we look at this from our perspective and we see those big trees, you know, think about maybe winter time, maybe it's spring, I don't know. Um, what, as gardeners in an urban space, what are we thinking about um, as far as what our plants need? So in this picture particularly, uh, we're thinking about sun and where to place that strategically in a limited space. So that goes into the impacts of the tall trees and buildings in urban environments. Um, and so shade is not necessarily a bad thing in gardening. If you're growing um, cool weather crops like spinach, lettuce, um, arugula, things that are gonna do weather, do good in the spring, particularly in our kind of cool rainy weather in our maritime climate, um, Shade is good. Shade will be good during the summertime when it gets a little bit hotter and there's plants that need a little bit of partial shade. Um, but so places like in an urban environment, whether you live, you know, in Tacoma or Seattle or anywhere in the Seattle metropolitan area, um, space is a challenge because um, we don't live nor do we farm, or I guess have the privilege or opportunity to farm on large open agricultural spaces. So. One of the great things that I love about the Garden Hotline and just our program, just Tilth Alliance in general, is this challenge of uh, growing and enjoying kind of the holistic and mental health benefits of gardening in an urban space, uh, which means you have to be creative with the space that you have. 
So lastly, you know, integrating your garden into the rest of the yard, I think is what this picture is demonstrating is um, the garden space with the raised beds to the right, uh, probably there's probably just grass there before. Um, there's most likely gonna be paths between it. It's not obstructing anything. It integrates pretty nicely into the environment, the built environment around it. Cool. How's everybody doing? Can you still hear me? Sound, <clears throat> sounding great. Okay, cool. So the next topic is going to be soil life, which is a big one that I would need probably a um, hundred million slides to accurately describe. And again, this goes back to soil being the basis for the success of your garden. Um, I think unfortunately, not unfortunately, um, it's hard for us as visual, you know, animals to, you know, figure out or understand what's going on in the soil. I guess other than the fact that we often don't, oftentimes don't see the soil, uh, we see a green plant and we can observe through experiential, you know, education, how it's going to grow what's successful and what's not successful. Um, but we don't often get to see the soil unless we were to kind of slice it up in different slides, almost like the one on the left. But, you know, soil is such a big part of gardening. And so a big thing at the garden hotline that we always suggest that people start to kind of get oriented towards is just soil health. And part of that is when you're gardening in an urban space is getting your soil tested. Getting your soil test helps understand potential environmental contaminants that are in it. So for those of us that live in the Tacoma area, there's the Asarco smelter that you know operated for a hundred years um, during the 20th century. It's since then been shut down in the early 90s and it's a super fun site um, and it has left a legacy of just kind of toxicity in parts of the soil. Um, so not to strike fear, but that's something to consider. Uh, the other thing too is just, uh, you know, the fertility of the soil. So what sort of nutrients you need, whether that's nitrogen, phosphorus, like trace minerals, if you need a good dose of just kind of organic material like compost. Um, soil testing will allow you to do that. Um, we usually suggest that people get their soil tested at um, King Conservation District here in Seattle for a, a nominal fee of, I think, like $22. Um, so how does, how does getting your soil tested tie into soil life? Um, this would be important just for us to remember that when we put things like fertilizers or any you know synthetic non-organic thing into the soil, um, any herbicides, any pesticides, all of those um, chemicals leave a legacy in the soil that greatly affects the biota, um, the complexity of the soil ecosystem. So again, it's just kind of knowing that the soil is alive in order to make sound decisions uh, or smart gardening practices that help reduce the uses of herbicides and pesticides. So there's a couple of just kind of fun quick facts on here. There's 100 million to a billion bacteria, um, several yards to several miles of fungi, depending on whether you have agricultural or forested land. There's thousands of protozoa and thousands of for forest soils or several hundred thousand in forest soils, I'm sorry. Um, and this is just in a very small portion, so really tiny. Soil is um, a material that is gonna be composed of minerals, organic content, and then a mixture of air, water, and micro microorganisms. So, when I think of soil, good soil, I think almost, I like to think of a sponge, maybe not the best example, but I think just the, you know, 
porosity of it with the holes. Um, soil is going to be, or possibly like a matrix. Um, and it's not just dirt, it's going to be open pockets of air where um, open pockets where air and water is going to be allowed to kind of um, interact with the fungi, the roots of plants, and um, just everything else that's living in the soil. There's other animals that play a really big role just to tie it back into what we're talking about in regards to habitat. So soil is also a habitat. Um, you have earthworms. Uh, we have a lot of, I think we have a non-native earthworm. There's, you know, red wigglers. There's all sorts of springtails, all sorts of um, just insects that, you know, play a vital role in uh, just kind of decomposing or degrading the um, decaying material that is then kind of recycled back into the system. And so, yeah, that cycle of death, um, which shouldn't hold a negative connotation, um, that's, the, I guess, decay and renewal, I think is highlighted pretty well in this quote by Wendell Berry, um, which just is just talking about, you know, the cycle of life that takes place in soil, which is pretty exciting. And then we have some facts down below. Um, let's see. Does anybody know uh, anything, or can anybody guess, or you know, take a moment to like think about our soil here in the Pacific Northwest? So our soil runs acidic, um, and what can you think about that may cause the soil to be acidic? So one of the, a couple of the different things, a combination of things um, that are, it's kind of exciting and revealing to think about is our soil runs acidic um, for a number of reasons. Um, one, if you think about all the, you know, evergreens that we have that have pine needles that fall down. Um, another big one is, is how much it rains here. So all of that rainfall is just gonna be kind of, you know, barreling down on the soil. So it's actually leaching, um, nutrients and stuff out of the soil, which is uh, lowering the pH. Uh, glacial till is another one, kind of an ancient um, factor, but still pretty exciting to think about time-wise. Uh, river valley soils are the richest, but they're harvested or built over. So um, I don't think about Seattle, but I think of uh, just kind of maybe old societies where they had a, a successful, maybe agrarian, practice. I think of the Nile and the Egyptians, but same here for the indigenous people. Um, river valleys are traditionally pretty rich in nutrients and are also fertile farming grounds. Um, commercial soils versus maybe what is considered native soil is manufactured, um, and it varies in quality in the sense that, um, you know, you pay for, you know, cheaper soil that's not the greatest quality and then you pay a premium for soil that is probably a little bit better quality. Um, amending the soil is, in part, is important for food and ornamental gardening. We talked about that a little bit, just understanding what's in the soil so you can kind of just make sure that that habitat is a um, healthy and living organisms. Uh, native plants are especially adapted to our region just because they have a evolutionary advantage of you know already growing under the soil conditions. All right, so um, non-natives. Let's think about non-natives for a second um, and kind of break this down. And we're going to try to, all of these, um, these topics all fall under kind of the umbrella and are related to gardening, urban gardening, and they're also related to habitat too. Um, so we may, we may kind of veer in an in and out of the habitat aspect, but it's always going to be the components that there. So let's see if we can explore this using the pictures that are on the slides. Um, can anybody guess what these pictures are? How about the one on the top? I don't expect anybody to answer um, 
by the way, just just to kind of just to kind of uh, think about it, I guess. So, um, just to give you some clues, one of these plants is, I guess, grows well here. I don't know if it's a native. Um, one of them is a noxious weed, so it's technically an invasive species. Um, yeah, so the the one on the bottom is uh, some form of knotweed, if anybody's familiar with it. Um, when I was an intern with uh, King County, I actually went out with the noxious weed team and they sprayed for, uh, just spotted out um, knotweed. Um, it, it grows really well in riparian habitat. Um, as far as habitat is concerned, why noxious weeds are so devastating is because they're going to compete for uh, native plants. Um, so whether it's an insect or a plant like non-native species, um, they're absent of their, I guess, predators. So they have some sort of strange evolutionary, not evolutionary advantage, but outside of the ecosystem that they're a part of, um, they thrive just because there aren't any you know, systems to keep them in check, not yet at least. Um, so think of knotweed, um, think of English ivy. Uh, yeah, all sorts of uh, poison hemlock is a big one. I noticed some poison hemlock um, down the street from where I live on Beacon Hill here in Seattle in an area actually owned by the city. So um, poison hemlock is a very kind of, you know, just dangerous nox noxious weed. Yeah, so these, these plants compete for other native plants. Um, and so they're part of kind of our urban gardening experience um, and also just things to consider. The picture on the top is kale. I don't think that kale is probably native to here. It could be, you know, some sort of, I guess it looks like Russian kale to me. Um, but yeah, it's just a urban vegetable. So vegetables, um, another thing to, that we want to think about when we're, uh, I guess this is a little out there from Habitat, so the, the bullet point's interesting, but one thing that we talk about often with people at the Garden Hotline, and this is related to soil health, is just the concept of crop rotation. Um, so crop rotation is just the process of not growing the same you know, vegetable or combination of vegetables year after year. Uh, what that does is that depletes the soil of specific nutrients, uh, which make it more susceptible to insects and diseases. So I had a caller once who was growing garlic. This person loved garlic. He was growing it for seven years. And then what had happened is he actually got um, a bad case of rust um, from some probably wild alien, something in the alien family. Um, and we basically explained like, hey, you might want to think about growing something in a different family, which is going to take up, you know, different nutrients than the those root vegetables or garlic particularly. So maybe try growing some kale, which is gonna take up you know, nitrogen in a different way. So all related to soil health. All right, so this is where it gets kind of fun. Do a little picture analysis here. Um, the garden population. So thinking about those organisms, uh, maybe thinking about scale, tying that back in. We have three pictures. Uh, the one to the left is one of my favorites. Um, if anybody isn't familiar with what that animal is, that is a gardener snake or a garter snake, one of those. Um, I have very fond memories of picking those up by their tail and um, bringing them inside and scaring my poor mother. Hopefully she's not in this workshop. Um, yeah, so these are just animals that we share, I guess, in our gardening experience if we're, you know, gardening outside. Um, I have yet to see a, guard, a gardener snake in, you know, like, a, I guess, like an edible gardening area, um, but maybe other people have. The one in the lower is, looks, looks like a European honeybee. So again, uh, the broad topic of pollinators in our garden. Um, and then the one at the 
the top right looks just like some sort of almost the little patterns make me think that it could be some sort of worm or some sort of caterpillar that's feeding on the um looks like a plant from like a gourd or a squash or something Yeah, so uh, the other slides real quick is thinking about uh, what animals we share space with that could be considered beneficial or animals, organism, bugs that can be considered problematic. Um, and I think this slide kind of demonstrates that. So take a moment to look at the pictures and just, you know, think about these animals and what they're doing or what sort of role they play in the garden. Yeah, so uh, problematic, I think is probably could be measured on a scale, some of these insects or I think a snail is a, is it a mollusk? It's something, it's not exactly an insect, but some of them are worse than others. Um, one of these on here is very famous for, you know, coming in plagues, I guess. Uh, and then other ones of these are, you know, they're, they're not exactly innocuous, but they're, you know, kind of maybe a pain. Uh, the garden slug is one, it moves very slow. Um, but, you know, can do a lot of damage, very hungry little thing. Uh, the one in the lower, the one in the right corner is a cabbage worm. Um, so if it's imported, that could mean a couple of different things. It could have been imported intentionally um, and then kind of, I guess, gotten out of control. A lot of times, uh, I think in pre-war United States and parts of the world, they're not pre-war, but post-war, um, there was a lot of attempts for biological control. So like animals used, um, I can think of like cane toads in Australia that were used as an attempt to uh, curb the cane beetles that were, I think, eating the stalks, but um, got out of control. The rest is history. Now Australia is overcome with uh, cannibalistic cane toads. Um, so imported cabbage worm, it could be an invasive, it could have come from somewhere else in the world, but uh, it has a particular, you know, taste for cabbage. So not really the greatest relationship. This, the slides, the three slides in the lower corner kind of show uh, just the life cycle of this insect from, you know, pupa to the caterpillar to uh, the full adult and the cycle starts again. Kind of gross looking a little bit. So the one in the middle is the green peach aphid. Um, I don't know what it is about the words green and peach together. Maybe it makes me think of like a like a Jolly Rancher or something. Um, not the worst name, but yeah, aphids are kind of um, just a perpetual nuisance um, for either ornamental plants or uh, uh, just edible gardening. Even under the best conditions, um, you can still get aphids. It's just kind of a, a fact of, of gardening is that we're gonna share our spaces with these you know, problematic residents. How am I doing, uh, not time-wise, I think let's do a quick check-in. So it's 12.36, so might anybody feel that I'm going too fast or is there anything we wanna cover um, that I may have gone over or skipped through? Um, no, I think you're doing uh, it at an excellent pace. Okay, cool. How's everyone else feeling? Welcome to enter in the chat box if you're shy. <laughs> Okay, I think we're good. All right, cool. I can't actually see my controls. I mean, I can see what I'm showing on the screen, but I'm worried to exit out of it just so I don't like skip around. So if just go ahead and communicate to me if I miss anything. Definitely. All right, so we're gonna continue our kind of romp through more problematic residents. And again, 
I think problematic um, can be judged on a scale and is open to interpretation. And so to kind of maybe break ranks with uh, Laura Matter, who is our wonderful director at the Garden Hotline, um, I may have a different interpretation of some of these animals. Um, so the uh, the one in the top left corner, uh, the Eastern Cottontail Rabbit, I don't know if that's the same type of uh, rabbit that is just, you know, everywhere here in Seattle, um, kind of to a ridiculous degree, but this cute little, you know, floppy eared um, bunny rabbit uh, is responsible for destroying kale, anything that's delicious that it's interested in. Um, the Eastern gray squirrel, I feel like we probably have 5,000 of them at the Good Shepherd Center in Seattle. Uh, they're also cute and I'm sure they have a very um, short, hard life, but um, again, it's just, it's an animal that, you know, as far as gardening is concerned, uh, is can be a challenging one to share a space with, whether I haven't had a lot of experience with squirrels eating things, but more so digging up things that, you know, they're either uh, hiding one of their many coveted peanuts or they're trying to dig up seeds or whatever kind of rascally uh, shenanigans they're getting into. The other one is a, is a Norway rat. So again, um, a rodent that we share space with, um, even if we don't know about it, but um, can be kind of a harbinger or carrier of disease. Uh, there's a lot of historical precedent for that. Um, there are things that you can do to reduce the presence of you know, rats, particularly um, if you have dog food, stuff like that. But that is uh, going off topic a little bit. Uh, mountain beaver. This is an interesting one. I've never seen a mountain beaver. I don't know how they interact with the garden environment. I think they're kind of rare. So I feel like, in my opinion, if I saw a mountain beaver um, and maybe a more, maybe like, I don't know, Snoqualmie or somewhere that's a little bit kind of more mountainous, um, and maybe it walk. Maybe you, if you live on a green space or like butted up against a green space, um, and a mountain beaver came in, would probably chomp on some of your edible stuff. But I don't know. I, I would feel pretty happy to have a mountain beaver in my garden. <laughs> uh, moles are another one. Um, I honestly am in the the opinion that they're more of an aesthetic nuisance than anything else. Can anyone guess why the presence of a mole would be a good thing in your garden? It's a good sign, basically. So what would a mole be a good sign for? Um, I think um, healthy soil because they wouldn't be eating grub um, within that soil and making tunnels. That is exactly right. So if you have moles in your, you know, in your garden or in your grass, particularly like your turf, um, then it is a sign that you have excellent soil health because that mole is in there. It's part of the ecosystem. It's a, I think, I think they're rodents. Um, and it's just, it's doing what, you know, the mole wants to do. It's, it's part of a, it's part of a food web um, and it's going to be eating grub and other things. Um, and uh, oftentimes we get calls for how to eliminate moles, you know, um, through, I guess, non-lethal uh, methods. And I usually just try to tell people, like, you can just learn. It's one of those things where we can possibly adjust our, um, our attitude and just, our, you know, how am I, do I, can I live with this animal? Cause it's not, you know, doing too much damage. Is it something that I can just kind of live with or change my, my view or attitude about? So. And then the one that is most surprising, but um, true, I think on some levels, just because they're so intelligent, uh, is the um, bird on the in the lower middle. Um, it says northwestern crow. I think I think the crows that we have here are classified as American crows. Um, and then there's some in the old world, I believe. But I think. I think it's just the American crow, maybe. Um, yeah, so a bird that's part of the corvid family. So um, another, you know, 
kind of pain in the proverbial butt would be a stellar J if anybody, you know, has had experience with those is in the Corbin family. So yeah, these are just very intelligent birds. Um, at the Rainier Beach Urban Farm and Wetland, where the garden hotline is um, actively restoring um, a pollinator hillside in front of our office. Uh, every Friday I go down there and I work with volunteers to um, just pull weeds and check on you know our native plantings and all this stuff. Is there are crows that you know live in the area or are just very observant. So what they'll do is they'll watch from somewhere. And then once we dig stuff up, I don't know what it is about digging it up. Um, there are some guesses, but once, if we dig up weeds or if we disturb the soil in any way, um, a couple of them will go through and walk through, um, I guess the space. And my theory is that they're doing that to see if we've you know, dug up any grub. So um, very intelligent birds. Uh, a bigger kind of thing just to tie everything in is um, a recent invasive species to our area is the European chafer beetle. Has anybody heard about the European chafer beetle? No. So the European chafer beetle um, is a, a scarab beetle that showed up, I think, in the SeaTac area around maybe 2014. Um, and what it does is the grub grows in turf grass um, over the course of the winter and then comes out of the grass like a, like a plague, you know. Um, the beetles don't bite or anything, but they, they come out in swarms and then they, you know, mate in trees and then go back into the soil and lay their eggs and die. It's a pretty like classic cycle for um, insects. But... What has happened is, um, in addition to the damage that the grubs are actually doing by eating grass, um, you have intelligent animals that we share these uh, spaces with that um, have found this like really bountiful protein source. So crows, if you, if you notice in the Seattle metropolitan area, particularly South Seattle, crows will be digging up turf um, along with raccoons and stuff. But crows particularly, if you see them kind of digging up chunks, it's because they're trying to find the grub for the European chafer beetles. That's amazing. Yeah, it's cool. And it, you know, it, it sucks because in a way there's a war on, you know, lawns, I guess, which are very, a source of pride and identity for um, here in the United States. But if you think about it in a different way, if it's reframed, like, you know, the crow is just like, Hey, there's like a bunch of, you know, cheeseburgers under the ground and like of course I'm going to want to eat that stuff <laughs> yeah some more problematic residents particularly these are plants um, bitter crests or what I think of as shot weeds so really easy weeds to actually pull up I almost find it kind of therapeutic actually because just they come up really nice um, there's no no like tap root that you break and get frustrated with but um the evolutionary advantage of that, I guess, or defense is that where it gets its name shotweed from, I believe, is the little seed pods just kind of shoot out everywhere. So it's perpetually going to be everywhere. In my opinion, it's a pretty innocuous weed in the sense that, it, you know, it's harmless um, other than just like taking up space, I guess. Um, the other one is going to be bindweed in the um, top right corner. Uh, we may think about that as morning glory. It grows all over everything. I left my bike out one summer outside and I came back a couple of months later and it completely had grown up throughout my bike. Um, I still have pieces of it in my spokes and my wheels. Um, so in the, to kind of bring it back to like a, a gardening perspective is this stuff will definitely grow in garden beds and it'll grow up and you know smother other plants and uh, outcompete um, stuff for light particularly just because it's such a, a vigorous grower. The one in the um, lower portion of the screen is going to be horsetail. And again, this is open to interpretation. Uh, different types of horsetail, even though they're considered um, a pain or you know problematic residence is they're grown ornamentally on occasion. Um, these particularly, there's three different types of horsetail. I don't know which one this is, but um, in 
I guess in uh, maybe like watery, like poor quality soil, these guys will shoot up. They get really big. And again, they're just competing for space. Um, this is an ancient plant. So it's been around since the dinosaurs. So, you know, that T-Rex or, well, maybe not T-Rex, um, that Stegosaurus or Triceratops that, you know, is in the new Jurassic World movie is probably going to be eating those. Um, a little gardening trick, if you take off the seed pod, which is in the left, um, that hopefully will stem the spread of it just because you're getting those seeds. And then also you never want to pull these out. You just want to cut them down because um, pulling them up um, breaks the, I don't know if it's a rhizome, but they'll just come back. Mm, I didn't know that. Yeah, and um, they're actually full of silica. Oh yeah. I don't know what silica is used for though. Is it a, is it, um, is it medicinal or like, what is it? Yeah, so um, uh, uh, silica helps the um, elasticity um, um, of your of your skin, but then also um, strengthening the bones. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So just to kind of add on that, um, yeah, weeds in gardening um, and how you decide to kind of frame or think about or more so maybe rethink or kind of unlearn what your idea of weeds are. So a big one um, is going to be the dandelion. Um, I grew up thinking that, you know, dandelions were maybe, you know, particularly in grass, like the enemy, right? Because they're not aesthetically pleasing. But uh, dandelions have, um, they're edible. The Coast Salish people um, like consume them as part of their diet. Uh, we keep them at the at the garden because they're actually really good pollinators for pollinating insects. Um, so uh, when you're gardening and you're thinking about your relationship with the habitat around you or the animals and organisms that you share a space with, um, try to think a little bit about differently, differently about some of the weeds. Um, dandelions, uh, clover isn't necessarily thought of as a weed, but um, it's not something that we usually want or we think it's a weed. Uh, clover is something that um, is, is a, a plant that actually fixes nitrogen from the atmosphere and enriches the soil, which I think is a very, I would say almost kind of magical process because I have no idea how that works. I just know that a plant is taking something out of thin air or so I think, and is you know creating nutrients um, for the uh, soil habitat. So I think that's pretty special. All right, so garden heroes. Um, in our world, there are heroes and there are villains as we have seen, but I would say there is a gradient and um, yeah, it just depends on how you look at it. But these are these are garden heroes, and I love talking about each one of these animals on here. Um, so you have that cute little fuzzball of a bird that's in the kind of lower left. That's a bush tit. Um, little birds that fly around in groups, and they're they're absolutely adorable. Um, they have nests that kind of they almost look like, I don't know, like balls of, big balls of like fuzz that hang down from the tree. Yeah, so uh, why would birds, um, particularly birds that aren't raptors or, you know, carnivorous feeders, um, well, that's not true. Why would a bush tit particularly be good in a garden? Um, it's going to eat, or they're going to eat um, bugs, so. We don't always think about this or more so I think the complexity of the garden space is not something that we can take in all at once, but um, you have a garden that is a living habitat, even if it's just, you know, ornamental plants. You're going to have these animals, um, the green stuff that you have in your edible garden or your combination of, you know, ornamental and edible stuff is going to attract bugs. Um, bugs are going to attract other bugs, bigger bugs that feed off of it, you know, parasitic bugs that feed off the bigger bugs. Bigger bugs are going to attract birds. Um, 
those birds are going to attract other birds. Um, so there's lots going on there just by starting that, you know, urban uh, gardening habitat. The one in the top, the animal in the top left is no stranger to us. You can tell by the silhouette and just the way that it's perched on the teepee top of that branch. Uh, lets us know that, you know, it probably weighs as much as a thimble. It, it is a Anna's hummingbird, most likely. Um, probably could be a male perched up there, um, just checking out his territory. I think you'd be hard pressed not to see hummingbirds just anywhere in the urban environment. Um, they're pretty prevalent with the advent of like feeders. Um, they're also, you know, really like certain plants that uh, they can get nectar from. There's a ton of those. Is it hyssop or hyssop? Different types of uh, plants that attract hummingbirds. Um, all sorts of ones that you can kind of grow in combination uh, with your edible vegetables if you want. So ground beetles, those cool um, little tanks are gonna be, you know, they're gonna be on the hunt for slugs and snails. I don't know if they eat the slug or they eat the slug's eggs, but either one of those. Uh, the one in the lower right is kind of cool, kind of scary. I'm glad I'm not, um, I'm glad I'm not the, uh, I guess, the prey of the parasitic, parasitoid wasps. Kind of has like a, a science fiction vibe to it, doesn't it? Um, so yeah, we actually have, uh, a lot of times I, it's hard not to like think that this is intense or just kind of disturbing, but it, again, it's just part of the, I guess, the order of an ecosystem or um, just the animals and uh, just the cycle of life that and death that, you know, Wendell Berry is referring to is uh, the presence of these, um, parasitic wasps, um, they don't, they're not going to be stinging people. What they're going to do is they're going to actually, the, the prey that they're looking for are going to be aphids. So um, they, they target aphids and I think they may actually lay eggs in the aphid. And then the aphid is basically like a buffet for the baby wasps um, that hatch out of the aphid and start the cycle again. Uh, luckily, we don't have any videos of that, but I'm sure you can let your imagination run wild with that. Um, how are we doing on time? How much time do I have? You're doing great. Okay, cool. So I saved my I saved my favorite for last. Um, can anybody guess what the animal is? The insect, particularly that's in the right. It kind of looks like, uh, I don't know, it's black and orange, kind of scary looking. I guess the uh, subtitle actually says what it is, um, which is a dead giveaway, but. So we, yesterday in our garden hotline, just to give a plug for the hotline, you can actually send any of your gardening questions to help at gardenhotline.org. And we will answer your questions with the best horticultural expertise. So use that resource. Um, yesterday, we got a couple of pictures from two different people, um, almost simultaneously, different people, different scenarios, garden hotline, how can you help us um, I have my plum tree that's not doing very well? It has these curled leaves and this is one of the bugs that's in the leaf. Um, please help me, I love this plum tree, like what's going on? So what this person had actually sent us a picture of was not, uh, I guess, a bad bug, um, but a beneficial insect, which was the, the ladybug larvae that can see be seen in the, the the picture to the right. So it took me a while to realize that this kind of scary looking insect is actually just, um, I guess, a different version of what it is going to turn into as a ladybug. But um, ladybug larvae, as well as ladybugs, they're predators that feed on aphids and other sap suckers, like I had said earlier. So they play a pivotal role in kind of a biological all natural way to help curb some of the pests that are not good in our gardens. 
So one thing that was interesting about this particular plum tree is it was also showing signs that it, had, it you know, had aphids. Um, and another thing that we realized is that this plum tree also had um, a fungal infection, which is known as brown rot, um, which afflicts um, just is kind of something that uh, plants in the stone fruit, you know, family have to live with. Uh, so what is going on there, though, is that um, it's quite possible that since the plum tree was, you know, suffering from this fungal infection, that it made it more susceptible, uh, more stressed, which made it more susceptible to disease, um, aphids, for example. So uh, the more a plant is going to be stressed because of lack of nutrients or some other thing that is, you know, afflicting it, like the fungal infection, brown rot, um, there's going to be aphids, which the aphids are going to attract the ladybugs. So um, just to do a little detective work that just kind of shows the complexity of kind of the animal kingdom uh, that we we really do interact with, um, whether we're aware of it or not, just in our urban kind of gardening spaces with, you know, edible fruit and stuff. Uh, parasitic wasps. I honestly don't know what's going on in this, this picture. Um, some sort of, I don't know, it looks like a caldoon maybe. I don't know what the plant is. It looks like it has some sort of beetle. I don't know if it's a bull weevil, something gross looking. Maybe there's some aphids there. I don't know. I think, I'm guessing that there are some wasps in the picture that are just kind of maybe have taken over these beetles and their, you know, terrible fate awaits them. Dragonflies. Another one of my personal favorite. Um, looks like this dragonfly is chilling on these, uh, some sort of onion or something in the alien family. Um, yeah, dragonflies, if, if uh, for whoever's here who isn't familiar with the life cycle of a dragonfly, it's pr pretty humbling. Um, dragonfly nymphs actually um, pupate or grow in water. And I think like it takes something crazy like three years for them to mature. They're basically these vicious, you know, stealthy, amazing predators that eat spiders. I think some, some species of dragonflies might even eat small fish, um, just any sort of, um, I guess, insect. And so how I would think about a dragonfly in context to this um, workshop or this PowerPoint presentation is oftentimes, even here in the urban environment, um, we're going to be living uh, butted up against uh, streams, which kind of, I guess, um, we have like almost spread out like veins over the landscape from uh, glaciers and just our watersheds and stuff. So we have, you know, we have many, many streams that flow out to the Puget Sound. And so we have um, just the, you know, macro invertebrates that live in these stream ecosystems. So um, we, when we have gardens and we're using fertilizers incorrectly or we're you know pumping stuff into the soil uh, non-organic fertilizers that have a you know don't stay in the soil but they leach out into the groundwater and into the streams around us like we're potentially affecting the ecosystems around us it's kind of a negative um, relationship and then just to add a little positive we also share these spaces with you know flying insects like dragonflies so um, once dragonflies uh, complete their life cycle or they're part of the life cycle that is in the water, um, when they mature, they turn into this other version of a predator and they kill a bunch of flies and stuff like that. Um, very impressive flyers. Um, they mate, they find other dragonflies that they have lots in common with, and then they, you know, like lay eggs and die and the process starts over again. So um, in regards to our garden uh, and, you know, getting rid of maybe some pests that we wouldn't want, uh, dragonflies are going to be our friends, other than the fact that they're amazing, amazing animals. 
Soldier Beetles, I'm actually not too familiar. I don't know too much about Soldier Beetles other than that they, it's just another, I think as their name implies, uh, they're just a invertebrate predator that's gonna, you know, prey on um, other bugs that are bad for the garden. And this is a cool plant. Um, I'm blanking on the name now. It's got that cool, uh, kind of almost electric violet or lavender color to it, which is impressive. Um, it has soldier beetles on it. So maybe if you're not familiar with what a soldier beetle is, you look at that and you're like, oh, it's this disgusting, you know, insect on my um, beautiful plant, but it's serving some sort of function. It's eating some pest that, you know, you don't want. So yeah, just kind of reframing it, reframing the, you know, the way that we live with uh, insects, um, beneficial insects, particularly in our, you know, urban spaces, like, Again, to just uh, go back to the European cross spider, um, people tend to be afraid of spiders and we just try to think about them as, you know, serving a greater purpose in life. Um, I guess, just like us, they have an objective, um, they have a purpose and they wanna do certain things and it's, they are just as much a part of the ecosystem, if not more as we are, so. Native plants, um, let's see, how can we tie this into kind of edible gardening? Um, we could use native plants maybe as like a deterrent, I guess, in some instances, or even as like a, to attract, I think the big one is just attracting pollinators, which hopefully in turn kind of have a, you know, a symbiotic relationship with the stuff that we're planting through, you know, providing pollen for these uh, native bees, um, whatever type of bee it is, but, uh, I don't actually know what the ones on the um, top right are. The one on the top right looks like it might be growing in the like kind of a riparian habitat. It looks like a willow or it could be a type of dogwood. I don't know. The one in the top left, I don't know if anybody can guess what that is. Maybe it looks kind of like an anemone. Anemone. Um, the one in the lower left, I believe, is an Oregon grape, so a pretty prevalent native plant that you'll see in spaces where they're trying to restore habitat or just kind of maybe choose ornamental plants that have a, you know, they're, they're, they live here, so they have more of a kind of, again, a symbiotic relationship with pollinators. Luckily, um, this one has a has a type um, of plants for me because I don't really know. Let's see. So I know the one on the bottom is lavender. So uh, <laughs> Apiaceae. I don't know how to pronounce that. If anybody else does, you know, go for it. Um, it's like the type of the flower maybe in the top left. If it's going in order, Asteraceae. These might just be. Um, Maybe these are like families perhaps too. Um, carrot, daisy, and mint family plants are wonderful additions to any garden for attracting beneficial insects. So yeah, there's that for you. Um, so if you're planting carrots or daisies or anything in a mint family, you're gonna attract, you know, you're gonna attract lovely little things like that um, uh, bumblebee in the top right. All right, so this groovy dude up in the picture here is um, partaking in some habitat building, which is something that we have done with, um, I think, second graders at the Children's Garden at the Good Shepherd Center. And it's interesting because um, if you look at the picture on the right, which is a, a mason bee habitat, it kind of looks like a bigger version of that with the the um, the pallets. Uh, so yeah, these are just two examples of creating a supplementary habitat, which you know is going to be always going to be a good thing in an urban environment, just because you know we have so much concrete, so much green space has been um, you know paved. Paradise has been paved to put up a parking lot to you know use the words of Joni Mitchell, I guess. Um, so habitat, creating supplementary habitat. So the one 
in the left um, can be used by wolf spiders. It can be used by overwintering insects. It's basically just creating a home for insects, and it's it's um, it's kind of it's promoting biodiversity where there may have never been before. Um, Mason bee houses, you can get those at any. Um, I think you can get them at pretty much any gardening store. They're pretty popular in the Puget Sound, particularly. There are some businesses that um, will rent you mason bees, which is kind of exciting. Um, if you have any questions about that, um, feel free to like, you know, field them in the chat. You can talk to talk to me about them one on one, or um, you know, feel free to email the garden hotline. All right. Um, successful garden habitat. So I think what we're doing now is we're kind of just tying in or just going over everything that we discussed in this presentation. So practice tolerance. Um, I kind of, I touched upon this throughout um, the presentation. I think tolerance is a good thing because um, from my experience talking to other gardeners and just, you know, myself, my behavior is um, tolerance in the sense of some of this stuff that we have, that we live with, um, we're never going to get rid of. Um, English ivy is one of them. Um, it's everywhere. You're never going to get rid of, you know, moles. Um, and I guess we have a, what we have power in, in that situation is just to maybe change our attitude about it. Um, you, not to say that you can't do things to deter these things, but that um, it's, a, it's a constant battle that, you know, there's never gonna be a victory with it. So you have to be vigilant if you wanna, you know, get rid of things like weeds. Um, some things, if you get rid of enough of them, they'll, they should be gone for a long time, but, you know, it's always gonna be um, some work, so. Eliminate pesticide use, uh, certified organics um, products if possible. So again, our mandate at the Garden Hotline or just our, you know, maybe our philosophy of teaching is just to try to encourage people to use organic products. Um, so any sort of soil amendment that you're making, um, it's gonna have an effect um, either positive or negative um, on the soil environment or habitat. So, uh, we suggest organic products just because oftentimes they're slow release, so they don't, they're not synthetic and they don't kind of leach out into the waterways as quickly. Um, so understand your garden ecosystem in order to prevent conflict. So on a larger level, I think oftentimes of the relationships that farmers have with wolves, um, eating livestock and stuff like that. So that's an example of a potential conflicting relationship with wildlife. Um, a smaller one, you know, could be raccoons in your garden. It could be some sort of pest. Um, and I think the, the point of that is just you know understanding educating yourself maybe beforehand just so you can take certain you know steps or precautions to reduce that relationship if it's not one that you want to have with an animal encourage diversity i don't think we talked too much about that but um that could just be the philosophy of not planting a monocrop or just maybe going a little crazy and like throwing in some wild flowers or things to, um, you know, uh, attract pollinators, you know, you could, uh, kale is really popular and kale is a biennial, I believe, um, so it's two life cycles over two seasons or it's life cycles over two seasons. Instead of cutting your kale down, you could let it go to seed and bolt and let it flower. The flowers are edible, they're pretty delicious and um, you're creating stuff for pollinators in the, so that's a good example of, I guess, diversity. Um, providing the right environment for your plants. Those are growing conditions. So light, water, uh, and soil. Um, so just to tie it back into that first slide or picture that we were looking at, um, that's an environment that you have to consider how those growing conditions are going to interact with each other. The more you think about that, the more money it's probably going to save you and the more um, labor. So it's always good things to consider before um, figuring out what your, you know, gardening environment or habitat is going to be. Provide the right environment for your garden heroes. So yeah, um, again, that just ties back into just all of the 
kind of smart gardening practices that we've covered is um, just thinking about your relationship and what you being intentional about what you're choosing to plant in your garden. So it's going to attract beneficial insects. Um, mulch is, we can't speak highly of mulch at the garden hotline, mulch, 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 um, anything, any sort of median that's, that's our, that's, you know, natural, that's going to cover the top of the soil, whether that be compost or some sort of like, um, arborist bark or, you know, wood chips, um, it's going to create, uh, just a temperature buffer. So the soils so you're going to be using less water, um, mulch can also be something as um, bountiful and free as uh, leaf litter, which if you're unfamiliar with leaf litter, it's just the you know leaves that fall from deciduous trees. And in those deciduous trees live a bunch of overwintering insects. Um, so larvae and eggs and stuff like that that are creating a part of their, or completing a part of their life cycle actually in the soil and the leaves. So another example of habitat. Um, Pull weeds before they go to seed, uh, water wisely. Um, again, just uh, watering uh, in, you know, in the morning when evaporation isn't as you know, prevalent in the summertime. Those are kind of out there, but those are also important to habitat. Uh, diversity. So we we had talked about this earlier. So um, there's some kind of, uh, if you look on one of the bullet points, there's a relationship of maybe companion planting daisies, carrots, and mint families. So you have an edible root vegetable, and then you have um, mint, and you have daisies, which are going to attract pollinators. So an example of companion planting um, that has a beneficial connotation for uh, pollinating insects. So add plants for birds. We talked about the hyssop, um, different types of pollinators that attract uh, hummingbirds. Shelter, nesting food for native species, whether that's insects or native pollinators or birds. Um, let's see if there's anything on here that I haven't really talked about. Uh, trap plants. Um, so marigolds are good deterrence for slugs in the sense that the slug sees a marigold and it's like, hey, who put out all of this delicious cotton candy? Like, I want to eat this instead of, you know, falling into a trap that you set for me or eating your um, tender greens that you, you know, want to take home for your family at dinner. Uh, let's see, introduce urban livestock to help manage pests and enrich garden soil, ducks, chickens, goats, and rabbits. Uh, they already have rabbits. I guess the irony about that is um, if you remember the rabbit is in one of the um, slides that talks about garden enemies, which you know is kind of humorous in the sense of it just shows the complexity of it all. But uh, if you have the space to get goats, I hear they're pretty cool. They eat a lot of uh, blackberry and stuff around here and they can you know clear out a lot of uh, invasive weeds and stuff. Chickens are probably great for their manure, um, and that sums up diversity. All right, so that concludes the presentation. Hopefully we weren't too bored and it sparked some questions. Um, so the follow-up to the question that I asked at the beginning is, you know, um, so after the presentation, how do you feel or think differently about living things in your garden space? So you could close your eyes. Um, it's fun to think about this with the senses. So like tactilely or smells or visuals, like um, with the information, uh, how do you feel differently about, you know, your relationship with the habitat um, of your urban garden and the organisms that you share a space with? Yeah, there's, there's so many uh, beneficial bugs and um, keeping an eye out um, and not thinking that they're pests. And um, I feel a lot better about, cause I've seen that, uh, I think it was the uh, 
soldier beetle in my garden before and I was like well that's scary I'm just gonna I'm just gonna walk away <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah totally yeah I think we're we're programmed probably on an evolutionary level to some degree but I mean bugs are kind of scary um I, most of the time it seems like we have a negative relationship with bugs particularly and that probably has a lot of cultural aspects to it um but most of the time, I would say in gardens, particularly, um, not most of the time, but there are there there are more beneficial insects than we probably give them credit for. So for sure. And um, I guess I never really thought about um, grasshoppers being, um, you know, um, more of a nuisance. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've never, I think that grasshoppers and grasshoppers, like things in those, that family of insects have a history of like um, swarming and uh, devastating like agricultural crops. I don't know how, I don't know if there's how, there's definitely probably some native grasshoppers that just are part of the environment, so. Yeah, so just as long as they're not swarming like a, bunch of locusts and then having those those scare beetles pop up in your garden it is it'll be okay <laughs> yeah um yeah for sure all right i'm gonna stop sharing my screen that's okay definitely yeah um uh i had put in the chat um about um uh, my grandmother always telling me to plant um, marigolds around my gardens. And she was like, oh yeah, um, they're just basically like a sacrificial plant. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> oh, that always cracked me up. But when you, when you said that, I was like, it's true. <laughs> it is a sacrificial plant, but I guess all edible plants would be a sacrificial plant. That's very true. Plus, they're pretty. They are. Had that little pop of color. Yeah. So I had um, I had put a bunch of supporting links in the chat box and also on Facebook Live. Awesome. That's great. Can you see how many people viewed the Facebook Live thing? How does that work? Oh yes. Um, yes, we can definitely um, see how many people have have viewed it. Um, I'm gonna check if there's any questions on there. There is not. So we're going to pop off uh, Facebook Live. So thanks for tuning in and um, check out all the links for more information.